Welcome to the Tech Today podcast powered by CEO Radio. It's your host, John Mayetta. I want to spend more time on CEOs today, our CEO Raider platform, which you can visit at ceoraider.com. And I wanted to focus on the payment space. You know, why is it that FIS, Fiserv, Global Payments, why did the legacy payments companies miss out on peer-to-peer, which is what drove PayPal uh, with, with, with Venmo and with Square's uh, Cash App? Why did they miss out on uh, Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency, which may or may not be a, a bubble fad. I tend to think it is, but for the time being, it's it's driving results for uh, Square for sure. But I didn't see PayPal's latest numbers. You know, we don't have this attribute in our CEO rated platform, and I don't know that it's an attribute, but it's sort of. I was just just thinking about it. I guess a good way to describe it is diversity of experience. So when I think about companies like ACIW, uh, former CEO Phil Heasley scored at the bottom of our CEO personality analytics study that we published back in 2018. And a number of those CEOs are gone that finished at the bottom of our ranking, which isn't a surprise to us, maybe to people who haven't read the report. And with, with, with the legacy companies, whether it's legacy payments, legacy software, my experience has been that you have companies that grew up doing, a, doing what it, whatever it is that they do, their bread and butter business. You know, it worked in the past, and now some 10, 20 years later, uh, that bread and butter business has has slowed, and CEOs and executive management teams, but CEOs in particular, are, are hesitant to go outside their comfort zone. And so they're content to manage a, a slow growth, highly profitable business. Maybe they have a reputation on the street for delivering margins. I'm thinking about the legacy payments guys now. And that's sort of it. And they're in that, they've sort of boxed themselves in with investors. And they don't have anybody in the management team that has experience maybe in another vertical or has maybe a personal passion where they have taught themselves and they're well-versed in ancillary technologies that may give a boost to revenue growth. I'm thinking about now PayPal, which isn't a a newbie to e-commerce. I think I opened my PayPal account. It was before the dot-com bubble. I can't remember when. Maybe 94, maybe 95. Maybe I have my years mixed up. I don't recall when they were founded off the top of my head. Maybe it was 97. But shortly after they were founded, I remember I was one of the original customers. Got that original email sent to a Yahoo email box way back when saying that, hey, if you open an account, you get, I think it was 5 bucks or 20 bucks towards e-commerce purchases. They would subsidize your account, and that's how they grew their their customer base initially was by subsidizing it. So uh, PayPal has been around for a long time, and I think that you know they got lucky. Life is about luck, oftentimes, and they got they got lucky in that they acquired Bill Reedy's company. And Bill Reedy, very talented uh, fintech entrepreneur. I think I first came across him with a company called iPay when iPay. I think I did a call with them back in like 2006, 2007, shortly thereafter they were acquired by a company I followed called Jack Henry. And then Bill Reedy left iPay, went to, um, I don't remember the next stop off the top of my head. I wrote about this. You could probably find it on Tech Today. But ended up as CEO of Braintree Payments and then uh, was acquired by PayPal uh, where he became COO. I think while at Braintree he acquired Venmo. Again, you can read about this at Tech Today. We wrote about it maybe a year and a half ago. And I want to say they bought Venmo for something like $28 bucks. So he had the foresight to see what peer-to-peer could be. Now he's running commerce for Google. So it'll be interesting to see what he, he does there. But he was the one, not CEO Dan Schulman, who drove results at, at PayPal. So these CEOs, you know, we had CEO Raider in our, in our rating system. We don't, we don't have the expectation that they have all the knowledge, the domain expertise at a nuanced level required to drive growth, let's say, right? I mean, you're delegating a CEO. As we've written about, as we've talked about on this podcast, innovation doesn't start in the, in the C-suite, even if the CEO is a relatively young engineer for a software business, right? Because a CEO, you're, you're, a CEO, you're removed from the day-to-day workflow, and it's those who are on the front lines performing the work that see the opportunity for innovation a more efficient way to do the work or having the ability to identify competitive threats to the work that they're doing, that's where the innovation tends to happen. And so it would seem to me that in the case of FIS, Fiserv, Global Payments, there's just nobody in the management team that's in the weeds that understands at a nuanced level what's really going on 
in the payments world because they're not using these tools themselves in their day to day. So they don't even know which, which questions to, to ask as to as to uh, what type of products could be disruptive. Maybe they saw the threat for Apple and the other platform players to be disruptive in payments. Maybe they they, they didn't even recognize that threat. I don't know. I haven't had conversations with any of those CEOs or management teams. More surprising to me, because even if you saw the threat of Apple coming, there's not a, a, a ton you can do, right? You're just hoping that Apple doesn't quickly recognize different ways in which to monetize its phone-based platform, its phone network. But the one that, uh, the opportunity that was sitting at the feet of Fiserv, FIS, Global Payments, was Stripe. If you spend any time in the payment space, and I was in and out of there for, I launched the FinTech practice at my old investment bank in 2007, 2008, and I left banking in 2011. So I only played in payments formally for three years, although I've maintained an interest over time. But one of the things that was immediately apparent was how complex the, the, the physical infrastructure of the payments industry was in terms of the different participants required on the back end to execute a transaction. If you wanted to incorporate e-commerce capability into your, into your retail website, for example, it, it, it wasn't easy. And then Stripe came along and basically built APIs on top of all the infrastructure. So it became very easy to knit together all of the uh, requisite components to have the required back end capability to process a transaction online. That problem was staring everybody in the face, that problem of complexity. Yet nobody at the legacy companies pursued it. And this wasn't a problem that required hundreds of millions or billions of, of, uh, of spend to, to resolve. Number one, it required recognition of the problem. Number two, it would have required a budget. And that's one of the things I'd like to see from technology companies that have been around for some time is they ought to be talking about invest to investors and investors ought to be asking questions about how much capital do you budget each year toward innovation, whereby we may not see a return on that spend, where basically it's budgeted venture capital. You know, not enough companies do that. And I'm not talking about creating a formal venture arm per se, but just an experimentation expense line within product development, or maybe it's separate from product development. And we've written about this as well. But that, that problem that was ultimately solved by Stripe, two brothers who I think at the time of launching of Stripe's founding, which was what, 29, 2010, I think we're 20 years old, 19 years old. So it just makes you wonder. And so I come back to diversity of experience. I come back to putting hard dollars toward innovation. I come back toward something else we wrote about some time ago as it relates to building a variable compensation component toward innovation. And these comments of mine are relevant to every industry, but I'm thinking about technology primarily. And so as, as, as CEO, again, we, do, we don't hold the CEOs accountable per se, particularly large companies for having deep expertise in these nuanced areas but what type of mechanism have they set up internally within their companies to, to make sure that they're staying on top of opportunities threats that could be right around the corner that could be opportunities a few years down the road you know that that type of thing needs to be operationalized otherwise you run into a situation like we have with fis fi serving global payments where there's no growth where some combination of two of those three will probably merge with each other and, and, and trying to defend against Apple, PayPal, Square, Stripe, Plaid. You know, that type of a merger is only going to delay the inevitable. So it's my hope that with CEO Raider, we've, you know, we're still a young company, but we've been out there since end of Q1 2017 now. It's, it, it's, it's my hope that we help educate institutional investors as to these issues, particularly if you're a large holder in a particular company. And you have the ability to influence change at the top. And we start to raise the profile of these issues. You know, these issues aren't captured per se, like this issue of innovation that we're talking about today. It's not going to be captured in formal guidance. It's not something that a company is going to report on. But it does manifest itself in the numbers. If you look at the growth rates of PayPal Square versus FIS, Pfizer, Global Payments, as an example. So it, it, it becomes exceptionally important as to who a particular company has in the CEO chair. Because if you don't have the right person leading the company, there's tremendous opportunity cost. That's all for now. See you next time.